Today we are here to talk about redefining dad bod. That's the title of our topic today. And we've got a really wonderful guest, Alex, uh, who's got a personal training background and has also started the defining dad bod movement. So we're going to dive deep into that uh, with Alex today and hopefully give you guys a lot of tips. Uh, you know, dad bod has a traditional definition. I was actually, uh, Alex, looking it up um, a little bit before we chatted and, and I thought I had to read the Urban Dictionary definition of dad bod which is uh dad bod is a male body type that is best described as softly round but we want to throw that out the window so alex tell us a little bit about yourself um you know first of all just your background in fitness and how this idea of defining dad bod to mean what you want it to mean how, how did that all come about uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. And Urban Dictionary is fantastic for the, you know, the meme definition of of what you need out there. So we'll get more into that in a second, I'm sure. But the uh, my my story actually started in the fitness industry way back. I have a uh, a disease called Ehlers Danlos, which not to bore you with all the details, but basically just means my joints are way older than I actually am. And I I lived a life of a lot of injuries, and I love sports, so I had to rehab myself, and so that actually pushed me in the direction of understanding the human body really well, anatomy, physiology, kinesiology, and nutrition. Incidentally, all those played into me not being stuck on a couch somewhere taking pain pills all the time, and so I actually used that knowledge to start a personal training career about 13 years ago. And so I've gotten to work with anywhere from, from kiddos and athletes all the way to, you know, I have a I have an 82 year old woman that I train right now and she's happy to get out of bed without pain. So uh, my my experience in the industry has been pretty, pretty far and wide. And when I became a father, which was about three years ago, was the first time in my life that my health and fitness, it, it not only one did it have to stand for something bigger because when you become a dad your paradigm completely shifts and you're not the star in your own movie anymore but also something happened to me i didn't know what happened to me i wasn't sure but i, I kind of lost motivation i got a little depressed i ate way more brownies and drank more bourbon than i was used to you know <laughs> the the real stuff you know that that you kind of would associate with the dad bun i'm like what the heck is going on here man so I started diving into the research around the biological changes that happen when you become a father and it blew me away. I was like, why am I just now hearing about this? Why is this not front page, front page news? You know, I'm a, I'm a health, fitness, exercise, nutrition nerd and I don't know this, that the body changes when you become a dad and it, and you know, everybody talks about mom and, and to mom, if you're watching, thank you for being a rock star lady. But but dude, there's some serious changes that happen with dad. And so for me in in understanding that research and stuff, I'm like, somebody has to do something about this. I started looking for, for resources for dads and stuff and there was literally nothing. Like <laughs> there was literally nothing. So I decided that if I wanted to see a change in the world, then I needed to be that change. And so I started the Defining Dad Bod movement uh, to really dive in not only to the biology of it, but to uh, to create a vision of what dad bod should mean. And, you know, today we, we've titled this redefining dad bod, but Alex, with your movement, you know, a few years from now, when we think of dad bod, we want to think of it the way we're going to define it today. So hopefully this is part of making that change where it's the definition, not the redefinition. Um, so for, for you, Alex, when you talk about defining dad bod, uh, and then we'll really dive into the meat of our discussion, what do you want that to mean? What what does it mean to you in, in, with your definition? And let me just, as we've had more people log on, I'll, I'll go back one more time to that Urban Dictionary definition to catch people up to speed on what they describe dad bod as. So the Urban Dictionary definition is a male body type that's best described as softly round. What's what's the Alex definition? Well, and, and to add a little color to that, I mean, we all know the meme, dad bod, right? It's the guy who looks like he has, you know, too much pizza on the weekends and drinks a beer after work every day. You know, the fat collecting around the midsection, kind of like, you know, here's my high school picture. I used to be in shape, but dot, 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 right? And so, you know, for my part, I, I had an understanding of what I wanted dad bod to mean when I started the movement back in October of last year. And as we've as we've grown and as we've connected with other dads and stuff, we have a we have a podcast defining dad bod and we interview guys, we interview experts in the industry, we interview uh, transformation stories, people who have lost like 200 pounds and stuff. And we ask them, you know, what is 
defining dad bod mean to you? And if I could distill all of that down, then if we do our job right, then defining dad bod really has three components. First of all, it is a movement that asks dad what dad bod should mean. And dad makes a conscious decision about what his body should stand for, for him, his kids, his community, his career, that kind of stuff, rather than an accidental biological thing, you know, oops, I have dad bod, kind of like the freshman 15 of college, right? So it's it's a conscious decision about what your body means. Uh, two, if we've done our job right, then it is the exercise, the nutrition, the lifestyle that we hope to pass on to our kids. Not like I want six pack abs and I should lose 15 pounds and I should be able to deadlift 400 pounds or whatever but what am I passing on to my kids in the form of nutrition exercise and lifestyle because let's face it they do what we do and not what we say and so that's a that's a really powerful component of defining dad bod we're leaving a legacy of health and fitness for our kids and then the last aspect of defining dad bod is that it's a sustainable and consistent thing that evolves with you as a person so it's not just like a eight week program to you know get your beach body on. It's, it's, hey, this is me becoming a better version of myself now. And next year I'm a better version of myself than I was before. And the next year I'm a better version of myself than I was before. And if we do that right, you know, we will grow as people and our, our kids will also be able to grow as people. And I think we can make a huge dent in this whole obesity epidemic and uh, a few other things, but I'll, I'll not get too preachy at the moment. That's great, Alex. It was a great setup to, to our discussion today. So we're going to really hone in on two uh, things over the next 30 minutes or so. We're going to talk about what causes dad bod. So we want to be able to sort of really understand the root of the problem uh, from a variety of ways. And then we're going to give you guys some tips on how to redefine dad bod. So Alex is going to talk about some strategies that all of us can implement uh, to try to fight the dad bod from hitting us. Um, so I just, before we do that, I just want to thank the, those of you that are here joining us live in the live audience. Um, at the end of this, if we do have a couple of minutes, if you have any questions, you can feel free to uh, submit them in the chat and we'll be happy to uh, answer them at the end. So feel free to, uh, to take advantage of Alex and his knowledge while we've got him here. Uh, Alex, let's dive right into it. So let's, um, let's start with what causes dad bod. And, and for you, you talked about, you know, with your own personal experience, kind of wanting to understand the biological basis of dad bod and really researching that and, and understanding that. So fill us in, what did you learn? Yeah, it's it's actually mind blowing the, the research that's been done on uh, longitudinal studies actually with what happens when fathers become fathers. So you know, you have your 18, 19, 20, maybe 30 year old self whenever you become a dad. And at that point in time that you become a father, the baby's born, I like to call it the crying hamster stage. Sorry for anybody who loves newborns, but they, they, they cry a lot and they poop and they eat and you know, they wake you up in the middle of the night and, and whatnot. But during that stage of infant development, uh, three things happen to a man's body. The first thing that happens is his testosterone plummets plummets hardcore, almost to 40 and maybe even 60% of his normal testosterone level. So prior to baby, then baby happens, testosterone plummets, and it never fully recovers to what the biologists say, you know, the, the non-successful males who didn't, you know, reproduce. They have a higher testosterone than fathers do pretty much for the rest of their lives, barring some kind of crazy medical thing. Um, but dad, dad's testosterone starts to recover um, by age four that the, that the child turns four, then you know, dad has somewhere around 50 to 60% of his testosterone back. So it starts to come back up. But if you're a guy with multiple kids, then you know, when your youngest is four, that's when your testosterone has kind of made a pendulum swing back up. So that's the first thing that happens, testosterone plummets. The second thing that happens is in men, testosterone and serotonin are correlated, meaning that serotonin, that's the neurotransmitter, you can think of it as the antidepressant neurotransmitter. If, you're, if you've ever been depressed, perhaps you've been put on some a medication to help you through that time, they're called SSRIs, serotonin reuptake inhibitors, to help you not be depressed, right? So when a man's testosterone drops upon becoming a father, his serotonin also drops. And what really stinks about that is you're used to feeling a certain way and all of a sudden you don't you don't feel that way anymore and there are some exogenous things that you can bring into your body that will will fool your serotonin for a little while and bring it back up and those things are generally sweets and alcohol 
And so that's what I call the bourbon and brownies diet that that generally is is fostered into uh, define <laughs> into dad bod itself is is that drop in testosterone resulting in a drop in serotonin that will spur you to find other ways to elevate your serotonin. And uh, last but not least, your cortisol goes through the roof. Cortisol is the stress hormone, the one that if you think of all of the resources of your body, if you think of them as a candle, and as long as the candle has all the wax it needs, then everything's functioning the way it needs to. But if your cortisol is too high, you start burning the candle at both ends and depleting those resources. And so what happens to dad is his cortisol goes through the roof. Sleep quality and quantity are, are a big factor in that. And I'm sorry if you've got a newborn in the house, nobody's sleeping well. There's no way around it. Like your cortisol's through the roof and I'm sorry, brother. But on top of that, you all of a sudden as a dad, you have the weight of the world on your shoulders in the sense that if you're a provider or let's say maybe you're the primary caretaker, your your entire paradigm shifts. And the same could be said about women. The same cortisol spike is found in women, but their testosterone and serotonin aren't as correlated. So when you put all these things together, you're collecting fat around the midsection, you're losing muscle, and you're kind of depressed and it's easy to look for the way out of depression in the form of food. In fact, the very first episode of the Defining Dad Bod show that started this movement is called Dad Bod is Not Your Fault. And it's talking through the biological changes that happen when you become a dad. And some guys never recover from it. It's fascinating, you know, because you think of a lot of the practical things that will impact, um, you know, just, just having more on your plate, perhaps, like you talked about, maybe the kind of the traditional things, not exercising because of lack of time, grabbing food on the go, but but hearing you actually approach it from a biological level and, and you know, talking about whether it's testosterone or serotonin making you or, or perhaps, um, you know, pointing you towards certain nutritional choices, it's, uh, it's a really different way of thinking about it and looking at it. Well, yeah, and I, like, you know, my experience was he was about, you know, five or six months old. We kind of been living through this lack of sleep kind of thing. I was still going to work and doing what I needed to do. I didn't understand my testosterone and serotonin were so low. You know, I'm on the way home from work at 3 p.m. I'm a trainer of 13 years. I'm usually pretty solid, but I'm on my way home and I'm like, I need a pick me up. And I stop and I get a little bit of caffeine and like one of those stupid processed brownies from like the gas station why am i doing this i don't know but it's good <laughs> and and that kind of driver i'm not to say that your willpower is completely shot but hey man after a long day and two hours of sleep like brownie sounds pretty dang good so it it's really driven for, by a biological force that will certainly make it difficult to make intelligent health and fitness choices that's for sure so we are uh, going to talk about how to combat that, but let's just spend a moment on, um, you know, the lifestyle aspect of things. What can you say, you know, in your own personal experience working with other people that are trying to combat this, um, you know, how does, how does the lifestyle come into play when you're having a, a child for the first time? That's that's a really good question. You know, when when you first have a child, I, I did an entire episode on sleep deprivation, how to work out while sleep deprived, because that's its own monster. OK, like <laughs> you've, you've hung out with kids long. It's kind of like Navy SEAL training. I don't even know how to explain to you what what kind of tired you become. Uh, you know, post post baby Alex looks at pre baby Alex and laughs at any reason he said he was tired. That's for sure. So anyway, that being said, from a lifestyle perspective, it's it's important. If, if you have the opportunity to be cognitive about this, especially if you're doing this before your child's born, let's say you've, you've found out you're gonna be a dad and that's awesome, it's, it's a really good opportunity to sit down with your significant other and talk about the lifestyle that you would like to pass on to your kids. And I know that sounds esoteric and weird, but, but when you're sane and you don't have, you know, things kind of just happening to you, that's powerful. But then let's say you get past the sleep deprivation phase. You know, your, your child's six months old, maybe a year old. Some people kind of recover around two years old, whatever that looks like. Then you have the opportunity to say, okay, what have we been doing that we know we shouldn't be doing? What have we been doing that's not working? Uh, what, what have we been doing that's shooting our, our health and fitness in the foot? What are we doing that's making us look uh, kind of cruddy to a child that I hope when, when they grow up, they'll, they'll do the right thing, you know? And, and the way I was asking myself is like, what do I want from my boy? What do I want for him when, when he becomes, you know, a, a man in the world and stuff? What do I want him to have seen his dad go through? Because 
you know, it's one thing to say, hey, I'm really stressed out. I'm going to go for a run real quick, guys. I love you. I'll be back in a bit. And it's another thing to say, you know what? It's been a really hard day at work. I deserve this bourbon. Nobody talked to me. I'm going to watch Sports Center. And those are two very different pictures of a lifestyle for dads. So I'd say the first tip is to really identify what kind of lifestyle you'd like to pass on to your kids. And that can be a really powerful place to start. So let's, using that as a bridge, talk about how we redefine dad bod. So you've given us, you know, the biological basis. We've talked about mm -hmm. the lifestyle changes, um, you know, that occur and the challenges that that pose. So how do we combat this? You you went through it yourself and, and came out on the other side. So, um, you know, both <laughs> from your personal experience and what you've learned um, being in the fitness world, um, we'll, we'll approach this uh, from an exercise standpoint, a nutrition standpoint, and mm -hmm. also talk a little bit about the mindset around um, this and some tips that you yeah. have over there. But, um, but for you, Alex, what was, was there a personal sort of aha moment for you where it was like, okay, now it's time for me to do things differently or, or I just need to get it in gear now? Yeah, you know, when I understood that dad bod had a hormonal biological basis, then, you know, with, with my knowledge and experience in exercise and nutrition, I know that we affect our hormones every single day by how we do or don't sleep, how we do or don't work out, or how we eat or, or whatnot. And so when I understood that dad bod had a biological basis, I started thinking of my exercise, my nutrition, and my, my lifestyle, even mindset, in terms of how do I make my biology work for me rather than against me in this endeavor. And so with that framework, you know, the, the big thing that we do at Defining Dad Bot is we talk about the hormone pyramid, which is a really simple way to, to conceptualize the hormones that are complicit in creating the, the body you'd like to have, right? So from at the bottom of the hormone pyramid is insulin. We need to make sure that our blood sugar regulation is on point, which is something that you can is a very powerful part of when when we talk about working with clients and, and a very powerful part of our life in our house, I think you can 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 you know probably take credit for at least half of my six pack. I don't know, like at least half of it. <laughs> the, we'll big, take, we'll take three of us. <laughs> there you go, there you go. Uh, for for insulin regulation, very important part of that. And we can talk about the exercise and nutrition pieces that really affect insulin. And then on top of that is cortisol. So that's the stress hormone, right? We have to have some regulation around the stress hormone that's burning the candle at both ends. And then built on top of that is testosterone. So testosterone is a direct result of our insulin being balanced well and our cortisol being balanced well. And for ladies watching, estradiol is kind of on that same tier as well. It affects you a little bit differently, but if you have your insulin and your cortisol working for you rather than against you, then your estrogen and progesterone will be nice and balanced, which is wonderful, barring you know polycystic ovarian syndrome or a few other medical issues. And then last but not least is uh, the thyroid. And what really stinks about this approach in the sense that, that it, uh, it's very powerful and it works really well. However, the modern medical community looks at this from the top down, usually, when somebody says, oh, I've gained a lot of weight, I feel energetic, my hair is falling out, my nails kind of stink. They'll go, well, here's some thyroid hormone here. <laughs> Hopefully that helps. And a lot of people see, it's been my experience, especially since you know before my defining dad bod piece, I, I worked mostly with menopausal women whose hormones are all kinds of fun, by the way. The, uh, the thyroid piece elicits very little results, especially in terms of, of body composition, because the insulin, cortisol, testosterone, estrogen systems are, are working against that metabolic system and causing you know, fat accumulation, lack of muscle gain, uh, breakdown of glycogen, burning of, of the candle at both ends. So I could talk about that for a while, but that's generally the approach is to deal with insulin, cortisol, testosterone, and then your thyroid and get your biology working for you rather than against you. So let's, you know, because of what you, you just said a, a moment ago in terms of, uh, you know, usually be, being addressed top down rather than bottom up, I think it's worth mm -hmm. just spending another uh, moment on the insulin component of that. So uh, for, for folks Absolutely. that might not be as well schooled in why that matters, you know, how does having elevated insulin impact dad bod and, and so perhaps you could uh, uh, tell us a little bit more about that and then even from a nutrition standpoint you know what are the types of foods that are causing mm -hmm. you to have elevated insulin and how can you know what what you, you mentioned you can is kind of being a tool but what are some other foods that can help you control your insulin kind of common ways to do that 
Yeah, absolutely. So uh, what, what we do with regard to a hormone is we look at two nutrition habits that we can change and two lifestyle habits that we can change. And that gives us a really good ground to deal with each hormonal level. So with that being said, in insulin, the reason insulin is an important uh, piece of, of dad bod is it modulates with your blood sugar. So every single time you eat or every single time you don't eat, <laughs> you're you're messing with your insulin um, and and that might be a great thing it might be a bad thing what everybody on on this webinar should know is that insulin is the most anabolic hormone in your body it signals your body and insulin's not bad it's a, it's a great hormone that does really important things ask any diabetic <laughs> how important insulin is um, but when insulin's really high in the body it's anabolic meaning it builds tissue and it signals to the body, hey, we have plenty of carbs available. We don't need to be burning fat right now. And what that means to you is it shuts down your fat burn and it signals the body to create fat tissue from the excess carbohydrates in the bloodstream. And so what that means for dad bod is if your blood sugar is doing this number, you're eating really sugary foods, um, you're eating very low fiber foods, you're eating heavily processed foods where the carbohydrates have been broken down significantly, then your blood sugar is going to spike and then you're going to get hungry again in a few hours. And what that does is every single day you do that, your insulin creeps up a little more and a little more and a little more. And the higher your insulin goes, the, the more fat that you accumulate. And so insulin's really the precursor to getting your hormones under control. For instance, I've heard a, a lot of guys get testosterone replacement therapy, it grows some great muscle under all that fat they've accumulated. But until the insulin has been brought down through uh, intelligent nutrition, then, then you're, you're having a hard time really seeing the definition or the benefits of having that higher testosterone. And so to your question about specific foods, I, I think that people are very well equipped to decide what foods are good in their taste and, and in their diet and nutrition. However, I do give two parameters on the nutrition side for uh, insulin. If you feel that your hormones are unoptimized, especially as a dad and you're like, ah, my testosterone is probably not where it needs to be. My libido is in a rough place. I'm having a hard time building strength. My body composition stinks. Then from a nutritional standpoint, you need to limit your sugar intake. And I recommend my clients stay under 40 grams per day. Like a vanilla Greek yogurt has 17 grams of sugar in it. That's half of your allotment. <laughs> and, that, and that recommendation comes straight from the American Heart Association, actually. So, uh, and, and that recommendation can go up for somebody who's heavily conditioned, but, uh, but by and large for the average person, we're looking at 40 grams or less of sugar per day. And then the second recommendation is 30 grams or more of fiber per day. And that's primarily coming from vegetables. And so if we can limit our sugar and increase our fiber intake, then that'll go a long way to help keeping that blood sugar stable. And then where you can plays into that, especially with our personal coaching for clients, is that there are times in, in life where there's not a great source of, of food around you. <laughs> yeah, I have, a, I have a client I work with who works in an OR and you know they're they're on their feet for six to eight hours you can't bring you know a ham sandwich into the or you know you can't eat an avocado with a spoon like there's no you're not allowed in the surgical field with food right so so we load up on you can prior to walking into the or so that blood sugar is nice and stable throughout that long period of time because because you can breaks down extremely slowly it's like a carbohydrate drip into the bloodstream and keeps everything nice and stable for you so that there's no like cortisol spike, no insulin spike. It kind of rides under the radar of the pancreas. And so that that really helps people to modulate that blood sugar when there's either not good food sources available or they're not going to be able to eat for a long period of time. And uh, that can be pretty powerful. So that's that's the nutrition piece under insulin there. I'm sure you have a few comments. Yeah, that's no, that's uh, great stuff. I think on the, the limiting sugar and the increasing fiber, that tip you gave, that's a really easy way for people to kind of think about it without you know, being able to apply it, like you said, to their own dietary choices and their own dietary uh, style. So uh, that was great. Um, on the UCAN, I love that that story. I wanted to ask you um, from an exercise standpoint as well, you know, a lot of times people are trying to work out first thing in the morning. You're talking about limiting sugar and, and oftentimes, you know, you're about to go to the gym, you're about to work out, you grab mm -hmm. something quick, whether it's sports drink, uh, a typical energy bar and it's filled with sugar. So from a limiting sugar, but still needing 
the energy to work out standpoint, how do you see uh, UCAN fitting in? Oh yeah, it's it's a common recommendation across my clients who work out first thing in the morning. And for dads, a lot of times that's the only time we get to ourselves. <laughs> we wake up before everybody else does, and that's our that's our one hour or two hours to do what we need to do. And that's a mixture of uh, you can and protein usually in my world, and and usually for clients is is you know sometimes it's hard to get food in your system. It takes a long time to digest. Like say you eat a few boiled eggs, they're not going to hit your system for another few hours, honestly. So uh, you can and protein will help you in that, that state of glycogen depleted, but wanting to work out intensely. Um, and and that's, that's important because if you're, uh, a lot of people do the fasted cardio thing right now, and I, I don't have anything against primarily fasted cardio, but for dads, especially whose cortisols are cortisol levels are usually relatively high, meaning we've been burning the candle at both ends, fasted cardio will continue elevating that cortisol. And so we're, we're continuing to deplete the body, burning the candle at both ends. And so if we can get something like you can in a, in a protein supplement, that's gonna break down during our workout, keep us fueled and keep us from digging deeper into the stores of, of our body's ability to create hormones, then that can be a really powerful way to make sure that we get a good amount out of our workout. We're well, you know, we're well fueled for the workout, but we're not, uh, we're not shooting ourselves in the foot at the same time. And I think, you know, with, with time being a premium and Alex, you can certainly speak to this, you know, when you're fitting in workouts around also being a dad and especially being a dad for, for a young kid, uh, it's like, you want to make sure that time you're in the gym or that you're that time working out is productive. It's actually like you just said, you're not shooting yourself in the foot. So if your nutrition's out of whack going into a workout or after a workout, then in a lot of cases, it's, it's, you know, what did you just spend that time doing? Um, how much do you, subpar how much par at best? Say that again. I said it's subpar at best. If you're, if you're malnourished walking into a workout session, it's not any fun for you and it's probably not good for your body. So on, on that end, um, it was great uh, uh, tip from you on the nutrition side of thing. I just wanted to one note for folks, you know, we've been talking a little bit about you can. So when, when we're talking about sort of the, the metabolic end of it, um, you can has super starch, which is a unique uh, carbohydrate source that Alex was kind of referencing. It comes in very slowly like a drip. So it's keeping your blood sugar steady for an extended period of time, not elevating your insulin. So giving you energy, but not throwing your blood sugar and insulin haywire, which uh, you did a great job of explaining kind of all the repercussions of what happens when your blood sugar and insulin are out of whack. Um, let's, let's spend a little bit of time sort of on the, the practical uh, element of exercising. So, you know, there's, there's less time, you're getting less sleep. How do you, for yourself and for clients you work with, kind of talk about structuring workouts when you're just dealing with a new lifestyle, different bedtimes, different times you might be free during the day. How do you, how do you navigate that? That's a great question. There's, there's really two parts to that because in my mind, there's the sleep deprived part of parenting and then there's the, Hey, everything's running generally smooth. How should my fitness run then? And so in the, in the sleep deprived state, if that's you, you know, you have, you have young kids or I don't know, maybe you stay up at night worrying about your teenagers, whatever that looks like, then the sleep deprived state, you're best to keep your workouts between 20 and 30 minutes long. You don't want a very long duration because you're already taxed. So if you're training for a marathon, half marathon, please put that on pause while you're sleep deprived. You're not doing yourself any favors. Um, but during that period of time, 20 to 30 minutes, and I generally coach my clients to lift relatively heavy for three to five sets of work, 60 to 90 seconds of rest in between. I'll keep the supersets to a minimum. I don't want you like <sighs> breathing hard in your, your workout and, and you know dog tired. I want you to leave the workout feeling energized and renewed. And that is a great sign that you have created a workout that will boost your testosterone, it'll boost your growth hormone, and you'll actually end up more reconstructed following the workout than when you walked into the workout. That's a big deal. I want you to reconstruct yourself through your exercise when you're sleep deprived, rather than break yourself down. Because when you're sleep deprived, sleep is the key component to recovering. That's where all the magic happens. So if you, if you break yourself down and you really beat yourself up in a great workout, and then you're not sleeping, then 
you have you have effectively knocked yourself down the totem pole of fitness and that's not great so so that's that's part one keep those workouts 20 to 30 minutes maybe four to five days a week if you can fit those in and it's compound movements pretty heavy for three to five sets and if you have trouble with that or maybe you're deconditioned and and hey a deadlift hurts your back and it's not getting into your glutes and hammies like it's supposed to i would seriously recommend connecting with a professional who can help you you know navigate that space because i, I would hate for you to jump into working out and you know end up unmotivated because you injured yourself and that's rough so so that's that's piece one and then you know okay su sustainability in parenting because hopefully the sleep deprivation ends at some point and you get a bedtime they get a bedtime everybody gets a bedtime and everybody's happy right so as as you're recovering well then as a parent you know you know your schedule better than i do but my question always is is there any more i should be doing could be doing and if i'm unhappy with where i'm at then the answer is yes <laughs> there's something more i could be doing should be doing and uh, a lot of people overestimate how often they need to be exercising or how long they should be exercising to get results i personally work out maybe five to seven hours a week and i'm a trainer and you know i have I maintain between five and eight percent body fat, and that works for for my DNA and in my lifestyle and stuff. But uh, most of my clients think that I work out, you know, two to three hours a day, and that's just I don't ain't nobody got time for that. Like <laughs> you know, like that just that just doesn't make sense to me. So and and you know, I've worked with clients who, if you're doing endurance training, for instance, you have to your volume is quite a bit higher. But you need to find an amount of time that works for you. You need to communicate that with the support system in your life who's going to help you get that time away from, from kiddos. Or as they get older, you might be able to bring them into that with you. And then uh, if, you're, if you're unhappy with where you're at, maybe there's some, some tweaks you can make to your, your program design in order to get better results. There are things like supersets and eccentric, uh, eccentric focus and less rest periods, more rest periods, more weight. There's a lot of different acute variables that go into getting a great workout. And it's just a question of how do I get the most out of the least amount of time? And that can be a really powerful aspect of your fitness. What about for folks that are needing to, you know, train on the go, uh, perhaps are, don't have access to a regular gym, might be traveling a lot doing this. Do you, do you have, you know, your kind of one or two go-to fitness workouts that you like to do when you're not sort of ha have the luxury of a gym? Sure, sure. Uh, you know, first, first, I, my first, what, five years of my training career was all boot camp. Like you had a mat and you had a kettlebell and you had grass. Like that's what, like, that's what you worked with. And, and, you know, for me, I was able to maintain a, a pretty high level of fitness there. And, and many of my clients achieve significant results in that, that frame. And even now defining dad bod has a, a home training version of, of what we do to, to help people with minimal equipment in their home. So that, that being said, if I don't have a lot of time personally, I'm about to go visit some family in Podunk, USA. Uh, hi guys, love you. Um, there, there's, there's not like a, you know, a big commercial gym and all the, all the trappings that, you know, I, I like to work out in a sports facility. So, I, I will do, you know, a body weight based workout. I'm, I'm a really big fan. I'm not advocating CrossFit by any means, but I'm a big fan when you're short on time to do what's called the half Cindy. And the half Cindy is five pull-ups, 10 push-ups, and 15 squats in 10 minutes, as many reps as possible. And you just, you roll through that as many reps as possible. And usually you're, you're in a really good spot after that, but not everybody is equipped to, you know, crank out the pull-ups and maybe there are a few things that are keeping you from doing squats. So if you're pressed for time and maybe you don't have a lot of equipment available to you, my favorite pieces of equipment are a kettlebell, like a relatively heavy kettlebell for females, somewhere around 18 kilograms. Uh, for males, somewhere around the 25 kilo mark, you can do things like swings, you can do things like curls, overhead press, uh, a lot of fun stuff you could do with that. Then a TRX, relatively cheap piece of equipment, you can hook onto anything and do some suspension training created by the Navy SEALs, so it can't be that bad. And then last but not least, there are some resistance bands you can pick up on, uh, on on Amazon, I think they'll, they'll cost you less than 50 bucks and you can do rows and lat pull downs and curls and squats and all kinds of fun stuff. I think it even comes with a few videos to help you kind of navigate that space. So if you're pressed for time, 
it don't don't let that be an excuse not to get some fitness in. We can all take a walk, we can go for a jog, we can drop down and do some push-ups. The most important thing from a dad's perspective is that your kids learn that at least you gave it a good shot and you didn't just sit down and do nothing. So that's that's important. This, you just eliminated all of our excuses with all, all those tips. There's there's no no reason not to be able, like you said, 10 minutes, <laughs> 10 minutes is all it takes. Just need a pull-up bar and you can you can get a great great workout in. That's uh, good stuff, Alex. Um, I wanted to um, end with one last thing is um, chat with you a little bit on, on the mindset element of this. So just staying motivated and, and keeping plugging forward, you know, especially when you're just in the initial stages, like as you were mentioning of some of these biological things and, and you're just starting to figure out what's happening and trying to address it. Like, how, what, do you, what do you recommend? How do you tell folks you work with? How, how did you stay motivated yourself? Or how do you stay motivated? I shouldn't even ask it in the past. <laughs> well, it, that's that's a great question. You know, there's a, there's a number of ways that you can you can adapt your mindset in a positive way. I'd say the two things that I feel like I do, uh, I'm getting better at and and have intentionally gotten better at over over my time period in life is I've surrounded myself with people who want the best for me, and I make my goals known to them. And so what happens there and and that. Sounds kind of esoteric. Type out a Facebook status right now. Hey, I'm I'm really hoping to you know beat the dad bod and and do these things. I I want you guys to ask me how I'm doing. And you'd be amazed at how many people will jump on board with you, and how many people in your community, your church, even your home, your family will jump on board. And what's powerful about that is other people are motivated by your willingness to put yourself out there and surround yourself with people who want the best for you. And so when you when you do that and you make your goals known. You, you become better because of the people around you. And it, it really helps you in those times when, you know, I'm, I'm feeling a brownie and a bourbon. <laughs> hey, other people are watching me. It, my son's watching me. There are eyes on me to make good decisions and set a good example. And so if, if, that, uh, if that helps you, that, that can be a powerful piece for you. And then the other thing that I would recommend around a mindset is do a quarterly check-in with yourself around your fitness goals. Because what's powerful about being a parent, or I mean, just being a human in general, life evolves, you grow and, and things change. You know, I, if you told me a year ago that, that I'd be getting to hang out with you on an awesome webinar and have a conversation about defining dad bod, I'd be like, what, what happened? I, that doesn't make any sense, you know? So, so as life changes, it's important that you check in with yourself about your fitness goals. And whether that means, you know, writing them down on a note card and putting it on your mirror and, and, you know, telling Siri to remind you in March to, Look at your fitness goals and see if they've changed or you know for me it, it helps I, I recorded a podcast about smart goals how to walk through that conversation with yourself specific measurable attractive realistic and timely how to how to have that conversation think through that that exercise and then update your goals and so you know life's changing you're changing and it's important that from a mindset perspective you always keep in mind what that vision actually looks like or what you'd like it to look like so you can at least shoot for it and, and maybe you'll miss maybe you'll miss terribly fine at least you're better than if you didn't shoot at all and so that's that's uh, an important piece of the mindset that's that's great it's um you know and really it's it's clear that the the way you, you're thinking about this and approaching it you're you kind of there's so many different components to it so you know, we've only scratched the surface in, in the discussion today, and, and I'm looking at the clock. I, I, I can't believe we've already uh, been chatting for about 40, 45 minutes. But, um, Alex, before we wrap this up, um, you know, how can people who like what we had to talk about today and really want to dive in more to some of these components, um, how can they learn more? How can they find a lot of the things you've talked about that you are diving deeper into and exploring, whether it's from the exercise or the nutrition or the mindset component of this um, Give us a little plug for where people can find your stuff. Yeah, definitely. Um, so we're really active online. I, we do a lot of virtual coaching and whatnot. So you can find the bulk of our stuff, really the hub of what we do at www.definingdadbod.com. So that that really houses everything that we're doing there. Uh, we're also very active on social media. So you can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook if you'd like us to grace your feeds. We do videos and inspirational posts and discussions and whatnot. And that's at Defining Dad Bod, so you can find us at that handle. And then last but not least, if you really love what we're doing and you want to be involved in the movement, I'd encourage you to check out our Patreon account. That's we're a crowdsourced movement. And so that's www.patreon.com 
patreon.com slash defining dad bod p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash defining dad bod and through patreon you can, you'll see there are a number of tiers that you can give anything from one dollar all the way to to fifty dollars a month and each of those tiers have rewards associated like newsletters and meal plans and and uh videos on on how to sleep better and all that fun stuff so a lot of powerful stuff out in the the internet world if you care to get connected with us Fantastic. We, we really appreciate you uh, being on with us, too. Just brought a wealth of information to the table. And, uh, you know, we did have actually one question, which I, I thought would be a, a fun way to put a put an end to this because of the particular question. Um, so, yeah. you know, we're talking a lot about dad and focusing on dad. Now, you, you talked in the beginning how, how mom's part of the equation, too. So Linda uh, asks us, well, we'll, we'll flip it to give you a chance to, to speak to mom a little bit here to close this out as well. So Linda mm-hmm. wants to know, um, how to apply a lot of the information you've talked about for women um, in terms of wanting who or having trouble building muscle and and struggling to gain weight. I know, you know, the the hormonal pyramid that that you laid out. Um, what what in there perhaps would you say could be applicable to women um, who are sort of having the same goals in terms of fighting the dad bod? <laughs> yeah, the mom bod, redefining mom. mom bod. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate that question, Linda, especially, you know, my my wife is a, is a really powerful part of having developed this system with me. She's a dietitian herself, and as you can imagine, went through a lot of changes when she became a mother. So uh, one of the things that that is really powerful about addressing your hormones is that, yes, the biological system for males and females are different in the sense that, you know, females go through some changes in their life, males go through changes in their life and they're very different hormonal changes. However, the lifestyle nutrition factors that impact insulin, cortisol, testosterone, and the thyroid hormone, they're the same for males and females. So sugar consumption, fiber consumption, we didn't talk about it, but but activity, hydration, lifting weights, things like that. Um, you can go to uh, definingdadbot.com and find the hormone pyramid there. You can address each level of your hormonal well-being in the same way that that dads can. I will say a caveat for females, especially in childbearing, is that in the pregnancy and postnatal stage, especially if you're breastfeeding, there's some very, very special nutrition, exercise, and lifestyle recommendations that would differ completely from dad. An example would be dad could intermittent fast. That's actually a pretty powerful tool in in guys' lives is to go without breakfast every once in a while, and you'll see a boost in testosterone and a boost in growth hormone. Females, on the other hand, especially if you're breastfeeding, don't do that. That's a really bad thing for you. Uh, in in from an evolutionary perspective, you know, if if I intermittent fast as a man, that means the tribe is starving. And I should go get a wildebeest and drag it back to camp so everybody can eat. That's what evolution did for me. Wonderful. If I'm a woman and I'm intermittent fasting, my metabolic DNA is telling me, hey, stop eating everything. Slow down the metabolism so the kids can eat because they don't handle starvation very well. So what happens for a female is almost the direct opposite of what happens for a male in terms of intermittent fasting. So great question, Linda. I would say as long as you're not during pregnancy or directly post-pregnancy and breastfeeding, then you can follow the recommendations on the hormonal pyramid just like a guy can. However, there's some really important uh, things or caveats with regard to a female, especially during those stages. And then menopause might also be a, a time in your life where there there'd be some different recommendations, things like pulling excess water off of the body, which happens when progesterone and aldosterone get out of sync. Um, That's not something I have to talk to guys about, but that's definitely something worth considering as a female. That's great stuff. You know, we came, we came to hear about dad and you closed us out with a little something from mom. So Alex, with that, uh, we really, really appreciate you joining us today. Uh, Really appreciate everyone who uh, signed up live. Thanks a lot for listening. Alex, we will talk to you soon. Um, Actually, you know what? I did want to, I, I forgot to, I wanted to end with this again because I think it's, you know, we, we started with the Urban Dictionary definition. So now that we've, we've redefined that, but I think we need to close with, with your definition again. So to close this out, tell us two years from now, one year from now, whenever the defining dad bod movement, it takes over, what, what is dad bod going to mean? Defining dad bod is about finding the hero in yourself as a dad that your kids already think you are and letting your body reflect that by leaving a legacy of health and fitness for them. That's awesome. Well, Alex, thank you so much. Thanks to everybody for listening. We'll talk to you next time. Take care.